So, what is the physics we need to add to the story of the plasma in order to make our analogy go through? Well, what we have in the plasma case is a gas of particles that is overall neutral. So for every ion here, we'll assume there's one electron that came off of it. And just for simplicity here, we're going to assume that all the ions have charge positive one and all the electrons, well, naturally have charge negative one. It's of course possible in a, in a more realistic case for these to have charges that are multiples of the electron charge. But in this case, just for simplicity, we'll assume that let's say we have a hydrogen plasma where once you tear the electron off, there's no more to tear off of that ion. So, if this gas were sufficiently mixed, then basically in any small unit that you took, there would be an equal number of positive and negatively charged particles. The gas as a whole would be neutral, but also if you just took a little clump, an interior clump, it would also be neutral. But that's going to be violated because these particles are jumbled about. They're not sitting on a lattice. And in fact, what we're going to do is assume that they're in thermal equilibrium. You've seen thermal equilibrium before, not just in the icing model, but also if you've taken the maximum entropy unit in the, in the complexity explorer. And so thermal equilibrium, what we're going to say is that the population of each species, the density of each species at some point x, is equal to the overall density of that species times e, oop, times e to the negative energy that that species would have if it sat at point x divided by kt. So the energy of one of these species at some point x we're going to assume is entirely given by the electrostatic interactions. Okay? And so what that means is that if an electron is really close to a positron, or sorry, to an ion, to a positively charged ion, it's going to have a lower energy. It's going to want to be there. Whereas if an electron is near another electron, it doesn't like that as much. Okay? And so the energy of a particle at some point x is equal to negative the charge of that species times the electric potential. And then when we put that up there, we get that the density of each species is n naught e to the negative, or rather, sorry, the energy here is the positive, it's the, uh, it's the charge of the species times the potential, and then the negative of that energy is e to the negative s, or rather negative e s times the potential divided by kt. Okay? So, if we assume the gas is overall neutral, we assume that there's an equal number of positively and negatively charged particles, that means we can say that the density of, of the ions at any point in time is the overall density of the system times e to the negative e phi kt. And then the density of the electrons is equal to the overall density of the electrons in the system times e to the power of e phi over kt. Where of course this e here is the electron charge and this e here is just the uh, transcendental number in the, uh, the exponential function. All right, so how can we read this? Another way to say it is that as the temperature goes down, you're less and less likely to find a positively charged particle in a location where there are lots of other positively charged particles. The other positively charged particles will induce a very strong potential field, and that means to add another one is increasingly unlikely. As the temperature goes down, in other words, you imagine this system to sort of be more and more structured that whenever you see a positively charged particle, you're going to probably see some negatively charged particles nearby sufficient to cancel them out. Okay. Conversely, when the temperature is really high, the system is just flowing back and forth. All these particles are bouncing around as they will. And in fact, it now becomes more and more likely that occasionally you'll find an overdensity of positively charged particles in some point in the space. Now that overdensity will dissipate very quickly. But simply because the temperature is very high, there's nothing to prevent it forming spontaneously and then disappearing. Okay. So we have a story here about how thermal equilibrium works. Now we're going to ask how this gas that's constantly rearranging itself in response to the potential, how this gas would respond to the introduction of a new test particle. So we have our neutral gas, we have these particles here, and then what I'd like you to imagine doing is sticking in at some place 
in the gas, introducing a new particle, and we'll just say that's the electron. So now we have our gas, and we literally put in by hand a new electron. We're going to ask, what is the effect, what is the field generated by that electron at large distances? So this is exactly comparable to the problem in quantum electrodynamics. We have an electron, we put it in the quantum vacuum. What's the field that generates at long distances? What's the, what's the force it exerts on other particles at large distances? Instead here, what we've done is instead of assuming some kind of quantum vacuum, we've assumed that the plasma, there's some sort of already sort of hand, we've, we've, we've put in by hand a set of positively and negatively charged particles that we say are a priori just sitting there, okay, floating around and interacting with each other in such a way as to maintain themselves in thermal equilibrium.